Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the sixth lecture of this massive open online course on philosophical foundations of social research. We have already completed two weeks, I mean five lectures in two weeks. In the first week, we have discussed history of philosophy of social sciences. Within that, we have discussed empiricism and rationalism, August Comte and positivism, epistemology and ontology. And in the second week, in the form of three lectures, we have discussed Emil Durkheim's rules of sociological method, influence of sciences on so sociology, objectivity in social sciences, social facts and the autonomy of sociology as a discipline and social facts and the necessity of science, common sense and science, philosophy of religion, I mean in the works of, through the works of the elementary forms of religious life and the division of labor in society within the comparative social science frameworks and organic analogy and precursor to functionality. Okay. Now, we are going to proceed with the sixth lecture, I mean the, the first lecture of the third week and here we are going to look at Max Weber's the third week and the fourth week. Okay, uh, third week ha will have uh, two lectures and we will have three lectures in the fourth week. Mm, uh, I mean, we have divided Max Weber into two parts. Okay. In the first part, we are going to discuss how uh, Weber's theoretical positions and methodological uh, writings are a reconciliation between positivism on the one hand and neo-Kantianism on the other. We will we'll discuss this and then in the next lecture we will discuss Weberian methodology of the social sciences. Mm. And in the second part of Max Weber, I mean in the fourth week, uh, we will discuss uh, Weber's methodological individualism, social action, I mean typology of social action, I mean traditional social action, effective or emotive social action, uh, uh, value rational social action and goal rational social action. Goal rational social action is alternatively known as instrumental rationality. Okay? Uh, I mean whether all sorts of social action, they, they turn out to be meaningful social action or not. Okay? And, uh, and we will also discuss uh, Verstehen. Uh, Verstehen in German it means uh, understanding, um, then what kind of understanding? Interpretative understanding of social action uh, and which consists of uh, uh, two parts, um, direct understanding and indirect understanding. Direct understanding is alternatively known as observational understanding and indirect understanding is alternatively known as explanatory understanding and then we will discuss ideal types and so on. Okay? Then, then in, the, in this case, we will start with Max Weber's theoretical positions and methodological writings, how there are reconciliation between, between positivism on the one hand and new Kantianism on the other. Okay, we will see. Weber contributed heavily to the development of substantive sociological theory and in the uh, and to and to the debate on methodology okay weber's theoretical positions and methodological writings are if are, are usually characterized as affecting a um, reconciliation between positivism and neo kantianism okay Though Weber's positions were not, of course, entirely consistent throughout his life, it is possible to say that, in general, he rejected the view 
attributable to some new Kantians, of course, though not Rickert, we, we can, uh, if, if some questions arise, then we can uh, address this, uh, okay, that the cultural sciences are exclusively concerned with the uh, uniqueness of their objects of study and the category of causality is inapplicable in them, okay. Now, we will we'll also discuss a third criteria, uh, I mean third uh, area of interest for uh, Weber that is idealizations in the cultural sciences. Okay. But let us first start with how Max Weber's theoretical positions and methodological writings are uh, usually characterized uh, as affecting a reconciliation between positivism and neo Kantianism. We have already discussed positivism. Positivism is, is uh, nothing but supremacy of science over of the science over non sciences. If you slightly recall, we have discussed Comte's law of three stages theological stage, metaphysical stage and positivistic stage. Okay. We have also discussed there are certain sub stages within uh, theological stage, fetishism, polytheism, mon monotheism and but the objective of the of today's lecture is not that. The objective of the today's lecture lies in the fact how positivism as well as neo Kantianism they influenced Weber's theoretical positions and methodological writings. Then, then if you slightly go back a little, then we have discussed how positivism became a dominant school of thought in the 20th century, which suggests supremacy of science over non-sciences how positivists, I mean the proponents of positivism, they stood squarely against uh, theological as well as metaphysical, uh, metaphysical explanations of reality. When I say this, I mean there are different characteristics of positivism. We have already discussed this. I will I'll, uh, I'll reflect on this uh, very quickly because we have already discussed this in the earlier lectures. We have how, what we have discussed then? We have discussed positivism in terms of certain characteristics. What are those characteristics? What are those features? What are those central tenets of positivism? Now, first, methodological that science is distinct from all areas of human activity and creativity because it possesses a method unique to it that is methodological. The objective of science and religion may remain the same. Does it imply that science is equal to religion, religion is equal to science? They are they same? No, they are not same. Rather, then what differentiates science from religion? No, it is the method or a set of methods which makes a demarcation between science and religion. That is why the proponents of positivism, then, then, then we come to a point of contention that it is not the objective which uh, differentiates science from non-science, rather it is the method which differentiates science from non-science. Okay. People may say that the objective of religion is to arrive at the truth. The objective of science is equally arri to arrive at the truth, but that is not the question. The question is how to arrive at the truth, what are the processes, what are the techniques, what are the methods to arrive at the truth. Okay. These differentiate science from religion. Okay. That is why the first tenet of positivism suggests that science is distinct from all areas of human activity or science is distinct from all areas of human activity or creativity because it possesses a method unique to it. 
secondly that there is only one method common to all sciences irrespective of their subject matter that is called methodological monism. We have discussed oh, I mean we have discussed how monism means single one, dualism means two, pluralism means multiple right. Okay. And positivists try to look at the single method common to all sciences irrespective of their subject matter. Okay. Whether it is physics, whether it is astronomy, whether it is chemistry, biology or mathematics, there must be a, a common method or there must be a single method unique to all or common to all sciences irrespective, irrespective of their subject matter. Then what is that co common method, what is that single method that, that positivists were arguing about? For positivists, the third tenet of positivism suggests that, that what is that method then? No, that the method of science is the method of induction, okay? that is called inductivism. Then what is that method of induction? Now, how you arrive at generalizations by accumulating per, uh, uh, by accumulating particular instances, observations. What is that principle of uh, induction then? Now, you first try to uh, uh, collect all observational data, then put forward a tentative gen generalization which must be verified and once it, it is verified, the tentative generalization becomes a law then it gets confirmed. Okay? That is the principle of induction and positivists sided with inductivists. Okay? Now, what is the process through which you would like the, your tentative generalization to be verified? Then positivists argue that no, the, that the hallmark of science lies in the fact that all scientific statements must be systematically verifiable that is called systematic verifiability. Okay. That is why I, I gave you this example that if I say that I have seen a ghost then it must be verified whether actually I have seen a ghost or it is the psychological state of mind which forced me to see something uh, which is actually not there. Okay? Then positivists try to look at systematic verifiability as a hallmark of scientific knowledge. Okay? We have also discussed how there is a unilateral relationship between observation and theory in the positivistic schema. I mean observations lead to theory generation, but the converse is not true observations that we make are independent of theoretical commitment. On the contrary, theories are always winnowed from observations. Then there is a, there is a one way relationship between observation and theory. Okay? In other words, observ uh, theories are observations dependent whereas observations are theory independent okay, in the positivistic scheme and that also influenced Weber, no doubt about it. And then we also have discussed how positivists looked at the dichotomy between fact and value. If I say this is a table, this is a fact, if I say this table looks beautiful then I add value to it. Science as the paradigmatic uh, or as the paragon of, of knowledge production does not believe in values because it may look beautiful to me, it may not look beautiful to somebody else, then this is not fact. Then positivists looked at not simply Natu uh, naturalism or natural sciences, scientism 
which is reduced to uh, I mean which refers to uh, the fact that everything is reduced to science, everything is reduced to uh, natural sciences, but positivists also looked at facticity being attributed to science. Okay? That is why for positivists facts are always value neutral whereas values do not have any factual content. In other words, science always believes in facts and on the contrary science does not have any value commitments for positivists. As I said the inductivists start with collecting observational data without recourse to any theoretical commitment, positivists also start with, with observations or, or a set of observations. But there positivists take a different turn and they suggest that no from observations you tend to have at least two premises to confirm your statement okay, that from observations you come to a set of lodge premise number 1. Premise number 2 is a set of statements describing the initial conditions and your conclusion is a set of statements describing the phenomenon to be explained. Okay. From two premises you are going to provide an explanation, but it must always start with observations, a set of lodge, a, a set of statements describing the initial conditions which will lead you to a set of statements describing uh, the phenomenon to be explained. We have discussed this, I mean then positivists also argued that how are you going to do this? No, you are going to keep on accumulating your observations to verify your statement, to make generalizations. Okay? For positivists, observations always presuppose theory. We have discussed this. Now, there is another viewpoint which we have also discussed rationalism, uh, um, uh, I mean empiricism, uh, uh, posit uh, rationalism, positivism and so on. But let us see how this kind of supremacy of, of science over non-sciences has been interrogated. It, it was interrogated initially by Kant, Immanuel Kant, critic of pure religion. That, that, that there cannot be anything called pure reason, there cannot be anything called reason in its purest form. Okay? Whatever reason, whatever experience that we tend to see, uh, these are always constructed. That is why the followers of Kant, Rickert and others, basically they are called uh, neo-Kantians. Their viewpoint is this that our knowledge of the world is constructive knowledge, is always constructed and hence subject to, to selection and interpretation. These are these three are important. Our knowledge of the social world is constructed which involves uh, selection and interpretation of multiple data systems. Okay. How it is constructed? Our view of how our knowledge of the our image of the social world, how we look at the social world. Perhaps social world cannot be examined through the lenses of natural sciences, perhaps social sciences must evolve their own methods of inquiry, own methods of looking at reality. That is why New Kantians argue that our knowledge of the, of the social world is constructive knowledge. 
how it is constructed? No, it is socially constructed, it is economically constructed, it is politically constructed, it is culturally constructed, it is legally constructed, it is ethically constructed, it is uh, institutionally constructed, it is ideologically constructed and so on. Now, this, this is an interplay of different layers of constructions of construct different layers of construction of, of reality. For new Kantians, the, the way I look at reality may differ from the way in through which you look at reality or somebody else looks at reality. There will be multiple versions of reality, there will be multiple realities themselves. Okay? In this sense, if there, there are multiple realities or multiple layers of reality, then it contradicts with the viewpoints of positivism, which suggests that no, there is a distinction or there is a demarcation between uh, science and non science. There must be cognitive authority of science, there must be autonomy of science over non science, uh, and so on. Then, then demarcation between science and non science, cognitive authority of science, and autonomy of science. These things they were challenged by neo Kantians, and obviously, it was challenged more so by Max Weber. Okay. When we say it is this, this, I mean, our knowledge of the social world is constructed, then we tend to be selective about this, we tend to select. If I ask you, how do you look at demonetization in Indian economy, which happened in 2016? I am sure all of us will have different opinions. I am sure all of us will not have the same opinion. Okay? Somebody may say that no demonetization is, uh, was done with the objective of uh, procuring black money, uh, I mean uh, our economy could be saved. Somebody may uh, say that no demonetization was poorly planned. Uh, in fact, uh, the government tried to convert all black money into white money. There are different opinions. Okay? That is why you tend to select okay? from various perspectives at hand. That is why I told you, what is a perspective? Now, a perspective refers to a set of symbols which represent, which are representative in character. A perspective refers to a set of symbols which human beings used to select from all potentially observable aspects of nature. When I say nature, it includes both natural as well as social uh, phenomena. A perspective is above all a viewpoint. Okay? that helps us in selecting, organizing our perceptions and guiding our actions. Okay? That is why selection is very important. And once you select from the, on the basis of your perspective, on the basis of your positionality, then, then you tend to interpret it from the vantage point of your positionality as well. Our interpretations are not same, we tend to interpret differently. If I give you a set of data, if I to tell you that 70 percent of India's population, they come under the age group of below 25. If I say, suppose now there are 130 crores or 140 crores. Uh, population 130 crores or 140 crores population in India, out of that 70 percent of India's population, they come under the age group of below 25. Then I obviously come under mm, the age group of below 25, uh, above 25. Okay? Then I belong to that 30 percent group. Okay? 
but if I see say this this particular set of data information if I do this then what does it how how can interpretations be made how are you going to interpret this piece of datum that 70 percent of India's population come under the age group of below 25. Then somebody may say that yes the nation is very young then we have to groom this nation, we have to nurture this nation, we have to direct this nation in a proper manner. Okay? Our human, this we have a huge human resource then. Another interpretation would be then only 30 percent of the population in India belong to the age group of above 25 then. Okay? Then we have poor medical facilities, our healthcare system is poor. Okay, I mean our life expectancy rate is low then. Okay, the, the, the same set of the same piece of datum may elicit different kinds of responses. Okay, that why different kinds of responses? No, precisely because our image of of that piece of datum, our knowledge of that piece of datum is determined by some kind of a perspective, some kind of uh, a positionality, some kind of an ideology. Okay? That is why I said our knowledge of the social world is constructed, which involves selection and interpretation. Now, you will find in the context of neo Kantianism that, that the entire structural edifice of positivism was challenged. That uh, nothing is absolute, nothing is absolutely objective, nothing is neutral. Okay? Now, how you interpret that is why uh, if, if you are familiar with Michel Foucault, okay, Foucault said. Uh, Foucault talked about interpretation of interpretations. Okay. Uh, let me give you an example how Michel Foucault tried to look at interpretation. Of course, it is not a part of this, but the, such examples will definitely help you probe into the philosophical foundations of social research. How we tend to constitute or how we tend to form concepts? How are concepts formulated? What are concepts? Concepts are shorthand descriptions of reality or a part of reality. If when our when our real world phenomena change, our concepts are also bound to change. With changing real world phenomena, we tend to arrive at newer and newer concepts. If our real world phenomena are not static, then our concepts will also not be static. Our concept, concepts will undergo transformation. Let me give you an example from the order of things by Michel Foucault. Foucault said, Foucault talked about madness in, in the order of things. I mean, he was referring to how madness, the concept of mad, the term madness has undergone changes. He divided the historical epochs into three parts. Okay. One, renaissance, second, reformation, third, enlightenment. In the phase of renaissance, madness was considered a divine creation. That is why people very often used to say no, that uh, if somebody is not behaving properly or so, then maybe some ghost or witch has gone into his or her body. Okay? Madness was considered a divine creation in the phase of renaissance. But when the mode of production changed, our intellectual and political consciousness changed, then we encountered reformation okay and in the in the age of reformation madness was regarded as a criminal threat 
that is why you will find that people may say that if somebody is mad, no, uh, no, no, that fellow is trying to kill me, that fellow, I mean, madness uh, earlier was considered a divine creation and in the age of reformation, it was considered mm, a criminal threat. And in the age of enlightenment, the third phase, I mean, the world had already witnessed modernity, industrial revolution, critical thinking, uh, rationality, reasoning capacity, okay, uh, questioning the dominance of uh, God, religion, priests and so on. Okay. The entire phase of enlightenment okay, uh, okay, questioned such delineation of, of madness such conceptualization of madness. Madness was considered a medical condition in the age of enlightenment. That is why whatever mental hospitals that you will find, they all were created in the post enlightenment fetch. Because earlier, it was never considered a medical condition. Madness was never considered a medical condition, but today we always say madness is always a medical condition. It is not a divine creation or a, or a criminal threat. Okay, uh, of course, in 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 some some societies we see this, but this is illegal. This is unethical to say that madness is a divine creation or a criminal threat. Rather, it is only a medical condition. Okay, this is very important. Okay, that's how concepts undergo change. Uh, concepts undergo transformation with the change in the modes of production. We also tend to change our intellectual and political consciousness and with the change in intellectual and political consciousness, we tend to uh, tend to change our concepts, we tend to change our frameworks, we tend to change our methods and so on. Okay. Okay. That is why we have we have clearly discussed that how our knowledge of the social world is constructive knowledge which involves selection and interpretation. Okay? This is important. Okay? Now, if we have to uh, recapitulate very quickly what we have discussed till now, we have discussed how, how Weber contributed heavily to the development of substantive sociological theory and, and to, to the debate on methodology. Uh, and Weber's theoretical positions and methodological writings are usually uh, uh, characterized as affecting a reconciliation between um, uh, positivist and neo Kantianist positions. Uh, though Weber's positivist and neo Kantianist positions, though Weber's um, positions were not of course, entirely consistent with throughout his life, uh, it is possible to say that uh, in general he rejected uh, the view attributable to some neo Kantians, of course, not Rickert, uh, uh, that the cultural sciences are exclusively concerned with the uniqueness of their objects of study and that the category of causality is inapplicable in them. Okay? And Weber was committed to the widespread New Kantian insistence on the methodological peculiarities of the cultural sciences. If, if positivism uh, advocated methodological methodological monism, then New Kantians advocated methodological. dualism or methodological peculiarities. Weber was, a, was, a, uh, was an advocate of methodological dualism or methodological peculiarities. If, if the nature of our inquiry changes, then our methods must also change. Okay? Our, our research questions must guide what kind of methods that we are going to have, not the other way around. Okay? 
our objectives must guide our inquiry or our objectives must guide what kind of methods that we are going to deploy okay not the other way around okay uh, uh, if we are die hard in following a set of methods uh, a particular set of methods then then actually we are not probing into reality we are actually uh, trying to prove our ideology okay there therein lies the significance of the distinction between science and ideology uh, science and religion science and non science and so on okay we have discussed this in the case of durkheim already okay uh, i don't want to uh, to um, repeat uh, uh, these portions right now what we are going to do now we'll discuss how weber was was committed to the widespread new kantian insistence on the methodological peculiarities of the cultural sciences okay for weber these methodological peculiarities is methodological peculiarities okay um center on mm, the two related concepts what are those two related concepts no one is value relevance and secondly interpretative understanding this is cultural sciences the cultural sciences differ from natural sciences in the distinctive role of valuations in the formation of the concepts and in the distinctive type of knowledge involved in them a third area of methodological differences was thought by weber to be the huge of idealizations in the cultural sciences okay idealizations in the cultural sense we will we'll discuss this okay value relevance interpretative understanding cultural sciences but we'll have to move back and forth uh, a little when we'll be discussing uh, methodology of the social sciences i mean weberian methodology of the social sciences as well as uh, methodological individualism meaningful social action then interpretative understanding of social action ideal types and so on. i mean we'll we'll do that back and forth business okay when i said when 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 weber uh, pointed out that that um, there are the, these methodological peculiarities center on two related concepts of value relevance and interpretative understanding that that cultural sciences must differ from from natural sciences in the distinctive role of valuations okay uh, in the formation of the concepts and and in the distinctive type of knowledge okay this problem that how cultural sciences must be different from natural sciences that this problem obviously has exactly the same logical structure as the problem of historical causality okay for for weber knowledge if positivist suggested that no uh, knowledge has to be uh, has to be grounded through logic okay science must be based on logic okay uh, for weber uh, science or knowledge uh, or even even in knowledge in, in humanities and social sciences okay in social science research knowledge must be grounded not simply through logic but also historically it is also historically determined what kind of knowledge that we have today okay for for just like history the problems of practical social relationships of human beings uh, uh, and especially of the legal system okay for weber are anthropocentrically oriented mm. 
anthropocentrically oriented. What is this anthropocentric? That is they inquire into the causal significance of human action. Causal significance of human actions. And just as in the question of the causal determinateness of, of, of a concrete injurious action which is eventually to be punished under criminal law or for which indemnity must be made under civil law, okay, the historian's problem of causality also is oriented towards the correlation of concrete effects with concrete causes. Okay. When I say uh, causal uh, relationship, I mean there must be some kind of cause and effect relationship. Okay. Okay. Then, then uh, just as the question of the causal determinateness of a concrete injurious action which is eventually to be punished under criminal law or for which indemnity must be under indemnity mm, must be made under civil law the historian's problem of causality also is oriented towards the correlation of concrete efforts uh, i mean uh, correlation of concrete uh, efforts with concrete causes and not towards establishment of uh, abstract uniformities okay it must be context specific it then then as positivist suggested that science is universal or so knowledge is universal but knowledge of the social world is not universal okay it is context specific our human action social action individual social action is also context specific jurisprudence and particularly criminal law okay however leaves the area of problems shared with history for a problem which is specific to it okay in consequence of the emergence of the further problem okay that is why I said a distinctive role of valuations in the formation of the concepts. Now, what is that now if and when the objective purely causal imputation of an effect to the to the action of an individual also suffices to define the actions of one involving his own subjective guilt. Therein lies, lies the distinction between objectivity and subjectivity. Okay. For positivists, science is objective in nature the way we produce knowledge must be objective in nature. Okay. For new Kantians, no, our knowledge of the world is constructed and, and hence it involves certain subjective biases and so on, okay, which involves selection and interpretation. Okay. And Weber tried to try to mediate the two between positivism and neo Kantianism. In other words, Weber tried always tried to mediate the mediate between objectivity and subjectivity in source in in social sciences okay for this question is no longer a purely uh, causal one soluble by the simple establishing of facts which are objectively discoverable by perception and causal interpretation rather is it a problem of criminal policy oriented towards ethical or other values for it is a priori possible prior to experience, prior to empiricism possible actually frequent and regularly uh, the case today that the meaning of legal norms explicitly stated or elicited by interpretation okay, inclines to the view of view that the existence of the guilt in the sense of the applicable law should depend primarily on certain subjective facts in regard to the agent such as intent subjectively conditioned capacity of foresight into the effects and so on and under under these circumstances 
the import of the logically distinctive characteristics of pure causal explanation will be considerably modified. Okay? That is why I said it is not simply logically conditioned, I mean science uh, does not follow, uh, science uh, not only follows logic, but also how it is historically conditioned, how it is historically determined. That is that's why our knowledge of not only the social world, but also the natural world is not only logically determined, but also historically conditioned. Okay. The possibility, the, the, the possibility of, of um, the possibility of, of selection from, uh, from among the infinity of the determinants is conceived uh, for is conditioned first by the mode of our historical interest then our selection is historically determined okay this is very important when it is said that that history seeks to understand the concrete reality of an event it is uh, in its individually uh, i mean i mean you know, when it is said that history seeks to uh, understand the concrete reality of an event um, in its individuality causally what is obviously not meant by this as we have seen is that it is to reproduce and explain causally the concrete reality of an event in the totality of its individual qualities. Okay. Then history is exclusively concerned with the causal explanation of, of those elements and aspects of the events in question which are of general significance and hence of historical, historical interest uh, from general standpoints exactly in the same way as the judges deliberations take into account not the total individualized course of the events uh, of the case, but rather those components of the events which are pertinent for subsumption under the legal norms. Okay. Our real problem, our real problem then um, is nevertheless by which uh, a logical operations, uh, I mean our real problem is, uh, uh, is like this that by by which uh, logical um, operations do we acquire the insight and how can we demonstratively establish that such a causal relationship be exists between the causal relationship, I mean cause and effect relationship okay, uh, exists between mm, those essential components of the effects and certain components of the infinity of determining factors. Obviously, not by simple observation of the course of events in any case, okay. uh, certainly not if one understands by that presupposition less mental photograph of all the physical and psychic events occurring in the space time region in question, even if such were uh, possible. Okay. Rather, does the attribution of effects to causes take place through a process of thought which includes a series of abstractions? The first and decisive one occurs when uh, we conceive of one or a few of the actual causal components as modified in a certain direction and then ask ourselves whether under the conditions which have been thus changed the same effect or some other effect would be expected. Okay. This is this is very important. Okay. Then, then our our causal relationship that that we tend to, to look at, okay. what then is meant uh, when we speak of a number of possibilities uh, between which those, those uh, contests uh, are said to have decided. Okay. It involves first the production of, of let us say it calmly imaginative constructions, imaginative identification. Now, we will we'll discuss imaginative uh, identification, imaginative constructs uh, in, the, in the fourth week, 
but we are we are more interested in in the uh, now now moving away from moving away from Weberian position of reconciliation between positivist and neo Kantian positions to to the methodology of social sciences precisely because of such judgments so, uh, about possibility and uh, that Weber did not or Weber never subscribe to any of these views uh, any of the views between positivism and neo kantianism rather he tried to mediate the two you will find uh, at times he was uh, referring to uh, objectivity in social sciences and sometimes he was referring to no even this objectivity is subject to uh, multiple interpretations okay this is extremely important to understand weber's uh, value neutral approach towards social sciences on the one hand and value laden approaches to social sciences on the other. Thank you.